unto you today how excellent is your name how majestic you are lord we thank you for the privilege to be your own children whom you are feeding with your truth the truth that sets free we pray that today you continue to give us your word let your word come forth let your word be clear let your word be distinct let there be nothing that will confuse or distract us but let us receive all that you have for us that your name may be honored and glorified in Yeshua Jesus name we pray amen I want to remind you that we began a course of study a few weeks ago on course 124 marriage and family a kingdom perspective is going to be an expansion this time to bring the course up to date the lord is doing a work on all the courses to bring them up to date that there will be standard courses that meet every standard theologically and revelatory wise to cover all the bases so that each course when you take each course and study them you have fairly complete knowledge that you can, as a minister, be able to give to other people. Amen? Truth sets free and truth equips us with the ability to help other people. And so we've done two lessons, isn't it so? Two sessions. Today we do the third session. And the third session has to do with qualification for marriage and how to get into it. Especially the area of knowing who is uh, the, uh, the lost will for your life in marriage. How do we know the will of the Lord? first one is who qualifies to be married the second one is how do we know who to marry these are the two questions we cover today the first one how uh, uh, what's the qualification for marriage number one marriage is for matured men and women is not for boys and girls it's for matured men and women and when you say mature it means both spiritual maturity and physical maturity can we say spiritual maturity and physical maturity if somebody is physically mature but spiritually immature emotionally unstable there will be issues there will be problems it's going to be an issue there will be undue weight on the one the other person if somebody is also supposedly spiritually mature but grossly mature in the natural sense, it's going to create problems because emotional immaturity will interject and they'll be flip-flopping one day spiritual, one day carnal. So qualification number one is for mature men and mature women in the lord we're talking about kingdom marriage and family okay so he's in the lord and so remember what i told you governments cannot define marriage they cannot regulate marriage because they did not they are not the author of marriage the author of marriage is elohim the god of heaven and so we're talking about kingdom marriage so please you cannot also in the church worry yourself too much about what government is doing what they are the new things they are defining they are defining all kinds of marriage situation that's their business you see we cannot determine for governments what to do governments will do what they want to do and they will stand in judgment before the lord at the last day so we are talking about kingdom marriage and family this is an introduction to say hey whatever you're going to look at this course look at it from the context of kingdom marriage and family so it's for mature singles mature brothers and sisters in the lord mature spiritually mature emotionally mature physically this is so important number two thing is okay following from that maturity issue marriage requires people to have come to the place where they have come out from where they were come out from the family they have grown in ready to leave father and mother and siblings to explore by faith a new relationship room they have never gone through before you know what he said in the book of genesis chapter 2 verse 24 
Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. And the same principle in Ephesians chapter 5 about leaving father and mother to become one. So a brother who is still controlled by his parents or siblings is not yet mature for marriage. A sister who is, yet, who is still controlled by parents and siblings is not yet uh, mature for marriage. In the same way, somebody who is, you know, uh, ruled by what his peer group, you know, if, he's still, if somebody, a brother or sister is still facing peer group pressure even in church, born again, spirit field, in ministry, but he's still at that place where he's addicted to pleasing man, addicted to making people happy, that person is basically not yet qualified for marriage. Living father and mother is a loaded phrase. It's talking about coming to the place of independence from people, independence from people, you know, and having detached from prior relationships in order to go into this new relationship, this new holy relationship. So that's number two you can talk about. Living father, mother, siblings, others, in order to. It's very important. You see, marriage is an estate. It's, a, it's an estate. And it has distinct, clear qualifications. And so, it's a very important qualification. And then, the, 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 the third thing we need to talk about, qualification for marriage, has to do with the reality of what Yeshua said. Marriage is for those who are single truly. And there are two singlehood, and there is four singlehood, and there is secondary singlehood. Yeshua defined this singlehood, and take note of this, Matthew chapter 5. And listen to these brothers and sisters, in this course, and in all the courses that we teach in the Global School of Ministry, one thing the Lord impresses on us is to make sure that we get to know the truth that sets free. Look at Yeshua's qualification for marriage. Matthew chapter 5. We're now on the third one, which is singlehood. Matthew chapter 5. Verse 31. It has been said, Whoso shall put away his wife, let him give her a writing of divorcement. But I say unto you, now look at, you need to know Matthew chapter 5. Yeshua was comparing Moses and himself. Moses was the moderator of the old covenant. Yeshua is the moderator of the new covenant. Yeshua is the king of the kingdom. Moses was a servant under Yeshua. Yeshua is the ultimate. All power, all authority is given to him. So where Moses said something, you need to take it with a grain of salt until you hear what Yeshua said. Now he says, it has been said unto you of old, Whosoever shall put away his wife, let him give her a writing of divorcement. And remember, Moses uh, gave it to them because of the hardness of their heart. They couldn't take Elohim's standard, so he gave them an off-ramp. So, okay, if you have to put her away, give her a letter to, so that people will know that this one has been released from your, your loop, okay? But he says in verse 32, Yeshua said, But I say unto you, that whosoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication, Cosset her to commit adultery. And whoever shall marry her that is divorced, committed adultery. This is strong. Take note of this. So, kingdom marriage is for people who are truly single. They are single. They are married. It's for them. You know, let's go to Matthew chapter 19. Brothers and sisters, if you begin to study the Bible, one thing that will hit you is the way modern Christianity has totally kept the Bible aside. In Matthew chapter 19, people ask him, in verse 1, it came to pass that when Yeshua finished this says, he departed from Galilee and came into the gates of Judea beyond Jordan. Great multitude followed him and healed them there. The Pharisees also came unto him, tempting him, saying unto him, it is, is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? Anything. You don't like the way she cooks a goosey soup. You say, go. 
You don't like the way she cooks up on her soup. You say, go. She cooks rice. You say, oh, okay, go. Or oh, the way she walks. You say, I don't like the way you walk. The way you walk. The way you speak. Can I, is it lawful to do it for every cause? Look at how they answer them. Yeshua told us. Verse 4. He said, said and said unto them, Have you not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? And said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother, shall cleave to his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. Did you not see at the beginning what the owner of marriage, the author of marriage said? Look at what he said, verse 6. Therefore, when they are no longer two, but one flesh. Marriage is a union. It's not a relationship. The relationship is into the union. What therefore are joined together, let no man put asunder. Let nobody scatter what God has put together. This is Why did Moses then command to give a writing of divorcement? Put her away. Look at the answer he gave to them. He said unto them, Moses, because of the hardness of your heart, suffered you to put away your wives. But from the beginning it was not so. Remember, brethren, that there is a way the kingdom had operated for years before Moses. From Abraham to Moses, for instance, is 430 years. From Abraham to the receiving of the law. Then from the time of Adam to Abraham, go and check the generations. You see how many generations? He said, hey, you know, he said, Moses, because of the hardness of your heart, divorce was introduced because man was hard, unable to obey Elohim, unable to do his will. And then Moses gave them an off-ramp. And then he said to them, he said, in the beginning it was not so. From a kingdom perspective, it was not so. And I say unto you, whosoever shall put away his wife, and it be for fornication, and shall marry another, committed adultery, and whosoever married her that is put away, doth commit what? Adultery. Now, this is the king of the kingdom. Look at what he's saying. Yeshua is saying the only person qualified to marry in the kingdom is this person. You throw away your wife or your husband, you are unqualified for marriage. But he gave one simple provision. Take note of this. Somebody say, okay, what then does it mean? It means be married to the Lord and serve him. If you couldn't do it at his own terms, marry. Nobody should discriminate against somebody who is single, who is separated. Nobody should discriminate. No religious person should discriminate. They should discover their gift and calling. But he says, if you, for any reason, mess up marriage, you know, you should know. And pastors should stop giving people a free pass on evil. Tell them why they need to get it right. And get it right and enter and get it right and stay married. Tell them. Tell them, because when people are not told, they think this thing is like, oh, you can just wake up and uh, somebody told you, your mom told you, you doesn't like the face of your wife, and then you throw her away. You throw her away, are you able to stay alone doing the work of the Lord? Now, the only place, in the two places, the Lord gave and proviso. He said, except for the cause of fornication. Now, people have interpreted this differently. There are two principal interpretations except for the cause of fornication. One is the reality that from the Jewish point of view where the culture where this was given, Mary, for instance, was betrothed to J Joseph. They had not married yet. Then Mary was found with child. Now, it, presumably, she had committed fornication. Presumably. I hope you understand. The, in the Jewish law, once you go to a family and say, this person, I want to marry her, and you are betrothed formally, the wedding has not taken place, that person cannot look left or right, it's you and you high lord. So, between that betrothal and the marriage, if anything happens, the man or the woman is right to walk away. If 
the person goes to transact with anybody outside the two of them for any relationship, it has broken that betrothal. I hope you understand what I'm saying. So that is one interpretation of the fornication with anything that goes wrong in between the man and the woman, the man or the woman before the actual marriage. Now listen to this. We can even take a more liberal view based on simple interpretation and say, okay, the only reason when somebody can walk out of a relationship is if the other party goes to mess up in immorality. Then that person has a ground to say the marriage bond has been broken by the intrusion of a third party. And then one can say, you know what, on that basis, this person has done evil. But then you know what? This is not a cop out. This is not something somebody can lay hold and grab and say, okay, because of that thing that person did. The question is, is it an unpardonable sin? Is it part of the unpardonable sin Yeshua spoke about, which is like sin against the Holy Ghost? And the answer is no. It's nice to be right. So the Lord is saying, the point we are making here is this. Don't just, people should not just grab it because somebody, you know, the man or the woman did something messed up, then off the marriage goes. No, it doesn't work that way. The question is, what has the Lord said when somebody offends you? Are you able to forgive or not? But then, let's not go too much other than we're going to deal with this in detail. But let's put it this way. The Lord said, except a marriage fell apart. Because one of the parties was involved in immorality, you know what? Anyone who is married is married and should stay married by the grace of the Lord. And if for any reason the marriage collapses on that basis, the other person can now say, well, he can lay hold on this scripture and say, well, because I'm not the cause I'm the one who was injured and offended. And maybe he's a repeat offender. He or she was a repeat offender. And then I don't want to, uh, you know, destroy my life. I don't want to get into, you know, soul ties with evil. I don't want to even be affected by diseases. And I'm, I'm going. Now, we will get into all that. But the point I'm making is this. In terms of qualification for marriage, it is for people who are single. And if there was something that went on in a marriage that required a dissolution because a third party intruded to have a relationship with one of them, then it's something that should be properly dealt with with the leadership that the couple submit to. Amen? Do you understand the point you made? And this is important. So, then the question then is this. What are people who are wrongly married? And by that I mean, supposing a brother who didn't know the truth, or a sister who didn't know the truth, or someone who was an unbeliever went to be a second wife or a second husband to a woman who was previously married. What happens? We are going to deal with restitution in marriage process. If a man or a woman became a second wife or husband to somebody, from a spiritual point of view, there was no marriage. Are you understanding me? So, if the person knows the truth, the truth should set that person free. And it's happened. You know, in some ministries, we have testimonies of people who had the truth and knew that they were not married legally and lawfully, morally, spiritually. And the person hears the truth, he goes to the man, if he's a woman, and says, you know what? I've been living in sin with you. Because you were married before. You didn't tell me or, or I knew. But because of you know, the way I was carried away, I accepted to be your wife. Even though we lived for three years, the Lord says, I'm a sinner and you're a sinner. And, I will, and some believers have peacefully parted on that basis. And where one party is in Cassistra, so no, I don't recognize what God said. No, I just married. The one who wants to go to heaven is required to walk out of that relationship because it's not a, a Elohim sanctioned marriage. It's illegal in the kingdom. Anything outside the constitution is illegal. 
Amen. You don't remain in an error if you know the truth. The truth sets you free. And this applies to both the man and the woman. And somebody may say, what about their children that have come forth from that illegitimate relationship? The answer is two of them have a duty to make provision for the upkeep of the children, for the care of the children. Because it's a worst thing to fall into the hand of Elohim on the last day. And hell is a one-way place. It's a dead end. There's nothing to plead if somebody crosses the gate to hell. So please take note of that. Any relationship, okay, what are people who are not married, you know, you came to town, you went to an event, saw somebody, you like the person, boom, before you know it, two weeks later, you are, you are living together. They call it shocking in America. You know, let me tell you, what about that? The day you hear the truth, you walk out. Preferably peacefully, if two of them can discuss, if they are now Christians. But if you are not Christians, then one has become a Christian. The one as a Christian should seek counsel of the pastor and get out of that relationship of evil. Amen. And you know what, men and brethren, the Lord wants us to be very, very helpful. And somebody may say, okay, what does a woman who as a single was just a rough woman everywhere about town? And okay, now she is uh, 35 and has two children already for you know to two men even or whatever you call it you know is she is qualified to marry the answer is yes the life she lived was in the past that was her past you cannot hold her past against her it was a lie before she knew the lord even if she was a believer and backslid that does not disqualify her her previous sins were dealt with at the cross she is now a new creation all things have passed away. She's qualified to seek the will of the Father, know the will of the Father, embrace the will of the Father, and be settled in marriage. Does that make sense, brethren? So these things are basic things. They are no longer talked about. Because why? Pastors are looking for member. And because pastors are looking for member, they don't want to touch on truth. And in their very eye, people are going from church to hell the shortest distance to hell is the church why the church is a place of truth to whom who knows and does not do to whom greater stripes is a portion so marriage is not for everybody from a kingdom point of view number four marriage is not for those who the lord has given the gift of celibacy if the lord has called somebody to be celibate for his own use, marriage is going to be a very big challenge. One will not be able to handle marriage, the pressures of marriage, the issues of marriage. Look at what Yeshua said in the book of Matthew chapter 19, verse 10. The disciples said unto him, If the case of the man be so with his wife, it is not good to marry. But he said to them, cannot receive this same day to whom it is given. Take note of that. All cannot receive this saving, save them to whom it is given. For there are some eunuchs, take note of verse 12, which were born from their mother's womb. There are some eunuchs which were eunuchs of men and there be eunuchs which have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake. He that is receive it, let him receive it. So, there are people who may have the grace from the Lord, they call it from the Lord to be single unto him, to be married to the Lord, and be totally and wholly dependent on him for their satisfaction, and they have no need for fleshly satisfaction. Some people, if that is the grace the Lord gave to them, to go into marriage is to take a yoke that may destroy their lives. And he said there are people too who, because of the kingdom, like Paul the Apostle, because of the kingdom, they made themselves you know, for the kingdom's sake. He made up his mind. Look, the work upon the, his, the, the destiny upon his life was so huge and so great. And therefore, he will not, for any reason, under the sun. If he got involved with a woman, Paul said, I can't handle the way, way, way that comes from marriage. My goal is to preach the gospel to the uttermost parts of the earth where nobody has gone. And so, 
dedicated his whole life to be for the kingdom's sake. So those who have that grace and those who have that calling, they are better served single unto the Lord. Amen. So qualification for marriage, these things we have discussed, they are serious. People are not sharing these things because in church, pastors are making money off people. And it's terrible. Revelation chapter 18 calls it trading in the souls of men. Trading in the souls of men. Giving people a false sense of security. Not telling them the truth. And the people are just going on feeling that they're okay. And they're living in sin. And even some pastors are doing arranging marriages. They know that it's not a marriage. Somebody comes from Africa. An immigrant. To USA or UK or anywhere. And pastor will take somebody as sister and say, please, just agree. Let's make paper for him. That is evil. And the pastor who is responsible for that is in greater danger. You don't do arrange marriage. If you're a minister of the gospel, it's illegal, both in the kingdom and in the government. And if the government knows it and takes that person and jails him, people say, Perse church is being persecuted. That's not persecution. Amen? That's not persecution. It shouldn't be. Marriage is sacrosanct. And that leads me to the second part of this teaching. And that is, how do we know the will of God in marriage? Who to marry? Do you just take somebody you like? You like the height? You like the weight? You like the color? You like the education? You like the song? It was one case when we were in one church. We told somebody married somebody because of the voice. <laughs> And then the day after, look at this person's face. He couldn't stand it. So he had to wake her up. He said, please sing, sing, sing. Why? It was the voice that attracted him. Men and brethren, listen to this. The greatest decision you can ever make in life, beyond career, beyond school to go to, beyond anything you can ever do, is a decision on who is your marriage partner. It is the most critical thing you can ever be in life. You can ever make a decision to be. And if it is so, then we need to remember what we say that Elohim alone is a matchmaker. Don't let people pressure you into what they want. Don't let your own flesh pressure you into what it wants. Because the flesh lost against the spirit. I hope you know, in the book of Romans, I mean, in Galatians 5, and the book of Romans chapter 8, he said, the, to be carnally minded is what? Death. And in Galatians chapter 5 says, the flesh lost against the spirit, the spirit against the flesh. If your flesh leads you, it will lead you as far as your flesh can see. Your flesh cannot see tomorrow. So supposing because of a physical feature in a man or woman, a man or woman makes a decision, say, yes, this is what I want. You know what to do? A day will come when that physical feature is no longer there. Will you be able to still maintain your confession? And so that is why it's important not to allow your eyes to choose for you. Don't allow your emotions to choose for you. Don't allow pressures from people to choose for you. As I said the other Sunday, people, anyone has a right to say something nice about somebody to you. The Lord can use anybody, even in their foolishness, to open your eyes. The Lord can use anybody to kind of, uh, you know, tell you, sh sh introduce you to somebody. But when it comes to the decision to who is a married partner, is the sovereign decision of Elohim. And it is better to wait on him. And so, what it means therefore is, when people get to the, a certain age of maturity, one of the things that is spiritual to do is to wait on the Lord. Don't pretend it's not important. Once somebody is mature spiritually, mature physically, mature emotionally, wait on the Lord. The Bible says if we pray, he will answer. If he will ask, he will give. So wait on him. The Bible says wait on him. Wait on the Lord means marriage does not admit of crash landing prayer. Fire brigade prayer. Na, 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 na. 
God give me now. No, it's a long haul game. You know, Apostle Sheldon Sauderland of North Carolina, today we're praying for him, you know, and his wife in their daybreak with the king. You know what? He's 46 years married to his wife. Brethren, marriage still works. I'm so thankful to the fellow what he's doing in IMF. You know what? Marriage still works. In, in IMF leadership in the USA, we have people who are 42 years married, 43 years married, 45 years married, 46 years married. Isn't that world awesome? So marriage is a long-term game. It's not about today only. It's about tomorrow and next tomorrow. It's about 10, 15, 20, 30, 40, 50 years. So if people are going to live for 50 years together, 6 years together, it makes sense to truly wait on the Lord. So how do you know the will of God? One, as a fruit of prayer. That's one way. As a fruit of prayer. And we're waiting on the Lord to tell you. You know, there's modern day theology on marriage and, and uh, in the new plastic cross, you know what it says? Tell God what you want. He said, you deserve your heart, your grant. So tell the Lord you want that type of man, that type of woman. Uh, the man who has uh, two houses, two cars, who has this and that, he has that stacked up. And the woman who has this and that, who is going to be a showstopper, rather than all those things. These are carnal. They are not spiritual decisions. And so don't let anybody talk you into making the choice yourself. Your knowledge is limited. Remember what we said the other day, that it's like a rap. A wrap and wrap. Only the Lord knows what is behind the package. If it is so, wait on him. He will show you. So ask the Lord to open your eyes to see beyond the physical. The physical is limited. What will you do if any of those physical features are lost tomorrow? Maybe in an accident or whatever. Are you still going to remain married? Remember that we are three-dimensional beings. Spirit, soul, and body. Spirit, soul, and body. So if you focus on the body alone, which is temporal, what are the spirits that is eternal? What is soul? So, wait on the Lord. And listen to this. Every other way we share, make sure you wait on the Lord. Number two, Elohim can take the lead and show you who is your partner in marriage. He can take the lead. Elohim can reveal to you clearly. How can he do it? There are the revelatory gifts. In the revelatory gifts, you have no role. It's Elohim, in a sovereign decision, is speaking to you. And the revelatory gifts include audible voice. So you can say 2.1 audible voice. The father can speak to you and call by name a brother or sister and say that is his choice for you. You can hear the audible voice of Elohim. You know, the Lord can speak to his people. Remember Acts chapter 13. Holy Spirit spoke clearly. He says, pray me Paul and Barnabas for the journey, for the work I will give it to them. So Elohim can say this person and don't claim voice if that's not the way he speaks to you. In other words, get to know the way Elohim deals with you before marriage time. Because when he's now married, you see, he's not going to speak to you in a voice that is strange to his work with you. You, you see, um, Yeshua said in John, you know, chapter 10, verse 27, my sheep hear my voice. And they will not follow another. So don't go try to manufacture a way, I mean, he speaks to your marriage, whereas he has been speaking to you different ways all along. So his voice can come clearly to you. Number two, the Lord can speak to you by prophecy. A prophetic counsel can come. Prophecy should not control, prophet should not control you. Prophecy should guide you. Let it not be something he has been speaking to you through other ways than in marriage. You don't want prophet to tell you. Uh -uh. You can place a demand on a man and he speaks from his soul. And you think his prophecy is not prophecy. He's projecting his own feeling or thinking. And a lot of prophecies today are projected thinking and feeling. Oh, people say, I sense. The sense is not from the Lord. It's from their senses. 
Okay? Number three, the Lord can speak to you through dream and visions. Vividly. You are sleeping and there's a vivid portrayal of his will to you. And you can know it. You will know it. But then, a lot of people also go and give cock and beast dreams. They go to marriage committee or to pastor. How do you know I dreamt? Dream is very unstable or can be very unstable because dreams have three sources. A dream can be revelation from Elohim. Number two, a dream can be a multitude of business inside your own mind. Or three, can be a projection from Satan to derail you. To lead you in the wrong path. So we got to discern dreams. That's why it's good to, when you have a dream, it's good to, if there is anybody in the body who has interpretation of dreams, it is good to have a, a session with the interpreter of dreams if the person is around and say, This is what I dreamt, and let the interpretation come. So through dreams and interpretation, you can know the will of the Father. Another way you can know the will of the Father is other revelatory gifts, you know. You know, discernment. You can discern somebody. Paul said, henceforth no we no man after the flesh, but by the spirit. So you can discern somebody. Beyond what people know of that person, you can discern. You can discern you know, what the Lord has in that person that fits perfectly into yours. Discernment is one of the revelatory ways of knowing the will of the Father. Amen? There are other revelatory ways, but let's go on to other ways. You can know the will of the Father also through a burden the Lord lays on your heart for somebody. As a man or a woman, a burden. You are not thinking of that person. You are not uh, obsessing yourself about somebody. You don't have any lust in your heart. And that's why one of the things you must deal with is the spirit of lust. Lust is desire to have something or someone that the Lord didn't give to you. You must make sure you clear your heart of lust. Because when your heart is cleared of loss, you can receive burden from the Lord. So the Lord can give you a burden for somebody. A burden that is deep. A burden that is intense. It can come initially light and then it can come again. You try to shake it off. Instead of going off, it's even increasing. So through body, you can know the will of the Father for your life. Another way you can know the will of the Father is love. Agape, pure love, is not a fleshly type of love. It's not in carnal. It's not in sensual. It is pure, holy. It's how it happens. You know, and very few people are able to have the boldness to come to pastor and say, Father, pastor, listen, the truth is I don't know why everything about this brother, everything about this sister, I just love. And I, I just don't know how. And people are not able to give that testimony. Why? Because they are ashamed what will happen. Whether people will laugh at them. No, you know yourself. If that is the case, declare it. It may help the pastor to be able to discern the situation. So, true love, genuine love, the Lord can speak about somebody out of the multitude of people. Another way the Lord can deal with us is what we call, you know, providential circumstances. The Lord can, through providential circumstances, you know, take us to the place where his will is made clear. Providential circumstances don't come direct straight. Psalm 37 says in verse, um, is it Psalm 37? Hmm? Or verse 23. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord and he delighted in his way. Providential circumstances. Let's say you were in primary school and you, you were in primary school with the same brother. Then after primary school, you went to a race, supposedly to secondary school. And then you, 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 there was this event of schools in the district or town. And your path crossed again. Oh, okay. Ah, you, how are you? You greeted each other. And then you missed each other again. Next time, it's a job fair. You've come out of university, you come out, none of you knew, and suddenly you find yourself, ah, and there's something that, you know, a sense that this is not ordinary. So providential circumstances are those things the Lord orchestrates that you cannot put a finger on that comes, produces something of an outcome. 
So it has to take a lot of honesty to discern how these things fit in together. I hope you understand what I'm saying. So provincial circumstances, the Lord can through it speak to his people. Amen. Amen. The other way the Lord can speak is by Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit has a way of ministering to us. Soft voice. Inner voice. The knowing is there. You know that you know. Amen? And it can come. If it is so, please respect it. Design it. And accept it. Don't, don't shake it off. You know, but pray about it. The Lord can also speak to you through scripture. You are studying scripture. You are studying the scriptures. And then uh, the scriptures, certain things you are reading, they jump out clearly. And the jumping out connects with other things the Lord has been speaking to you about somebody. It could be even as we are studying this scripture, I mean this course now, the Lord begins to open your eye about certain things you are not quite conscious of and they begin to come through. So that can be a way the Lord can speak to you. Amen? And it is important. So we, we thank the Lord. There, there are things the Lord can also use an angelic visitation to, to bring a revelation to you. Angels can come. They, still, they are still ministering to the people of the Lord. Amen? And then, of course, the word of truth can, make, can bring clarity in your life. The word of truth. The word of truth can bring clarity. It can make many things about you that were, seem to be ordinary, seem to be uh, scattered. The word of truth can bring such deliverance from fear, deliverance from worry and anxiety, and can make everything come true. Now let's talk about benchmarking the knowledge, how you know that you know it's the Lord that is leading you. Whichever way the Lord spoke to you through all these things we have spoken about, whichever way you sense it is you, and listen, it is always best when it's not one way. Brothers and sisters, anybody wanting to go into marriage must be honest to yourself because in marriage, if you deceive yourself, you have deceived yourself. If you claim it's him when it's not him, there's no remedy for that situation. And forever, you walk under the knowledge that I deceived myself three years ago, four years ago when I told pastor what was not correct, what was not right. Amen? Okay, how do you benchmark to know the will of the Father? What is the critical test you subject it to? And that is found in the book of Romans chapter 14, Romans 14, verse 17 and 18. Romans 14, 17 and 18. For the kingdom of heaven is not meat and drink. Take note of that. But righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. For he that is being served in Yeshua is acceptable to Elohim and approved of men. I want to say something about this. We call them the three benchmarks. Some say benchmarks. They are like, you know, traffic lights. You are driving. What comes at a traffic light when it is amber, you know that it means slow down to stop. When it is red, it means stop, absolutely. When it's green, it means you can go ahead, you can proceed. Now, what is it, the, uh, what is it that you will use to know whether it is flesh leading you or the Holy Spirit leading you? It is these three, three things righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. How does righteousness play a role? Look at it this way. Righteousness is simply right standing with Elohim. Can we say it together? Righteousness is simply right standing with Elohim. Again, righteousness is simply right standing with Elohim. Now, whatever way you thought the Lord spoke to you, the question is, do you have right standing with Elohim? Do you have a sense of righteousness? Do you have a sense of righteousness about it? 
when you remember that brother, when you remember that sister, do you have this sense that you are in the perfect will of the father? Do you have that, you know, sensing that the father is well pleased with this? This is indeed his will. Are you understanding me? Or when you remember that brother or sister, is all your responses going to be fleshly, carnal? Oh, you are thinking, hey, I when I, I go with this man, I go with this man and display her, she's my own. If that is the carnal things that play inside of you and is not righteousness, is it even lust that is played? Is it evil you commit with that person that is playing your heart and mind? If it is lust, fleshly, it's a, re, it's a light. Stop there. But if you have a sense of right standing that you are in the will of the Father, that's a, a, that's a, a green light that says you can proceed. Number two, peace. Shalom. Wholeness. Do you have a sense of peace? Do you have a sense of peace to proceed with this journey? That's why you don't rush marriage. That's why we don't do what? Rush marriage. Anytime you see the spirit of rushing, you want to start and finish in three months. You want to start, you want even the next month. You know that the enemy is, at, is knocking on your door. Righteousness. The next thing is peace. Shalom. Wholeness. You are not agitated. You are not disturbed. You are ready to wait for the Lord to take you through the process. If you are having this impatience and this agitation, you want to take her into your own house, you want to da da da, you want to do this, you know there's something wrong. But when there's wholeness, when there's that calmness, that shalom, Yeshua said, In me you have peace in the world tribulation. Amen? So whatever that disturbs your peace concerning a man or a woman is a red light. If there's no peace, there's a red light not to go. No matter what people think or say. No matter what you even said before. If you lose your peace about a journey. And I need to say this brethren. A lot of pastors are misleading. A lot of these people by not telling them the truth. That you started a marriage journey. Is not a guarantee that you go to the altar. Let's say you started with. Oh, all excited. Everything was. Oh, let's go. Let's go. And you began the journey. Let's say. Two, three months down the line. Listen to this. There's a cough. There's a cough. Most people follow the, it follows that cough. The moment you think you saw somebody is the will of the father, you're excited, you can't even eat, you can't drink, you know all that. You are thinking about da, 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 da. you are so excited, you don't even see anything. Because the Bible says love covers multitude of all evil. So you if you see things, you won't see them. Everybody will see them, you will see them. You know why? Because there's a veil. Of love covering the eyes. Now listen to this. After three months, you will know whether you are on the track. But after three months, if doubt has begun to come, maybe you fix appointments for courtship. The person doesn't show up to you 30 minutes later. No apology. <laughs> you you agree on certain things. The next time the person just flouts it, doubt begins to come, and then. That leads to agitation, apprehension. Is it this person? Is it this person? Am I making a mistake? Once those things come, wait until they clear. Let the peace return. Then you know you're on the right path. If the peace doesn't return, don't go forward. Listen to this. Until the day on the pulpit. Some people may say it's wicked. But let me tell you, if even up to the day of marriage, your persuasion fails you. If you say, what will people say? Are you getting, you are putting yourself in a yoke. That's why the, that question that is asked is not a joke. That question that is asked is not a show. Is there anybody here who knows why these people will not be wedded? Then the minister will ask the two people, is there any, are you persuaded to go ahead? The reason why, why what will him joins together, no man can put asunder. Are you understanding me? And so, brethren, any time you lose your peace on the journey, for any reason on the soul, that doesn't mean call it off, it means stop. Go back to prayer. Pray. You can pray and pray. If the Lord restores the peace, you go ahead. If he doesn't restore it, wait on him to know what he's saying. And if for any reason 
he, ref, he, he does not restore it. All you are doing is counter terrors. The courtship is full of pressures and counter pressures and uh, suspicions and allegations and counter allegations. Please be careful with that baby, okay? Uh -huh. So please, let's be very, very knowledgeable about these things. The last one is joy in the Holy Ghost. If you are in the will of the Father, there should be joy. The joy of the Lord, which is your strength. The person may not have money. The person may not have this or that or that, that qualification, that this, that, that. But there is joy in you. And that joy is not lustful joy. This is holy joy. It's joy that you are in the will of the Father. Joy that this is the Lord's will for your life. And men and brethren, these three things, if they line up, they confirm what you said the Lord told you. If they don't line up, it means stop, get into prayer, seek counsel. And I need to say this before we close today's session. Counseling is so important. We're going to have a full session on counseling, maybe next week, Thursday, or maybe the upper one, because this course, we will take it properly. And I want to thank the Father for the panel discussion last Thursday here, teacher Apostle moderating uh, with uh, Pastor Norbert, Pastor Kemi, and Pastor Funke. That was wonderful, you know, where how you covered most of the things we discussed so far, and it shows it's something wonderful to behold that people are to, to be paying attention, learning. And I pray that everyone who's gone through this course, you will understand this course to the degree that you can teach it anywhere in the world. Because we are talking about kingdom marriage. We are supposed to come out of our various cultures. They have their marriage concepts, but those concepts are inferior to the culture of the kingdom. The culture of the kingdom is the word of the Father. And the word of the Lord says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Yeshua HaMashiach. We need to have the mind of Yeshua. And the way we have it is by studying. Let the world renew our mind. Let the world transform our heart. We come to live as kingdom citizens. And all we do is a function of that grace as kingdom citizens and ambassadors. You know, no teaching can be exhaustive. What we have done is to pass on the quantum of information so far, but we'll take a few questions right now so that we can tidy up on any area. Please feel free, those of you who are here, and those online, Pastor Grace is there by a computer screen and, uh, and uh, an iPad and uh, Mr. Gose is there. Uh, if you have any question, you can ask and they'll bring it up. But those who are here, is there anything you want clarity on? For purpose of understanding, yes, Mr. Kechia and Mr. Bola, give to them Thank yes. you very much for the teaching. Um, my question is, I've got two questions. The first question is, um, based on what you just said now, you said um, the kingdom culture is superior than the worldly culture. The worldly culture. Um, if, um, if somebody wants to get married, and um, like for, let me take this out from where I come from, um, from the eastern part of Nigeria, you have to um, sort out some certain things from the family before you are, you know, giving that go ahead to, you know, get married to that person. Does it mean that person will not observe those protocols? Yes. You won't observe If you're a kingdom citizen, mm. to observe them is to deny the faith. For instance, what they call Osu Ume, case system in Iboland. They say this person is Osu. We don't marry into that family or these people have been our traditional enemies or that community we fought over that land 40 years ago 50 years ago so we don't have any relationship with them you don't observe those things the only thing you can observe is the law of incest if they say this village people cannot marry because they are one blood that is a right incest is also in the kingdom no, what, I I, what i mean by that is going to the family of the as I mean the the brother okay. going to the family of the sister okay to observe the okay. protocol yes the traditional protocol before okay. he goes in for the white wedding okay now listen mm -hmm. you are going to honor family there are some cultures not all culture is bad mm -hmm. but culture you have to be discriminating the things that are in the culture concerning what to do to marry mm -hmm. that are 
okay, that are valid, that are not spiritually reprehensible, you will observe. But you don't take all hook, line, and sinker. For instance, they can't tell you, bring 20 cartons of beer. No. Bring us five bottles of whiskey. No. You can also go to buy their daughter. If you are from, say, like, you know, some parts of Igbo land where you have to pay. If he's a graduate, you pay that. If he has master's, you pay that. No. You don't do that. But there are things you do, you know, to the degree that is okay, morally okay. That's why you need guidance and participation of the church because you are part of a kingdom. Mm -hmm. You are not alone. You can't just go alone. Mm -hmm. You go and the church will do the negotiation, not even you. Mm -hmm. With the committee of the village and they say, this one, yes, we can do this one. Mm -hmm. That one, no. We're not going to give you money in lieu of alcohol. Mm -hmm. We are kingdom citizens and ambassadors. We don't drink alcohol. We don't give because the Bible says if you give, you are guilty as one who is drinking. We don't do it. And they know how to discuss with the people and the villagers have always respected mm -hmm. to the best of my knowledge Eastern Nigeria, villagers have always respected, you know, kingdom citizens who come with their churches to negotiate. You do what is right and proper, what is feasible out of love and appreciation for the person you want to marry, but any of the culture, like say, oh, you must go, the mother died 10 years ago, you must first go and uh, do this for the mother. Uh -uh. You don't do that because that's neocromancy. There's no communication with the dead. You understand what I say? Oh, the father is not here now, so you're going to do, we have to buy one and pour the grave to tell him to. No, you can't do that because that would be a faulty foundation for your own wedding to allow those cultures to intrude into your destiny. Pastor Grace, do you want to add to this or want to hear the next question? Amen. Then the next question I've got if um, that brother or that sister has gone through that protocol. Like, I'm still going to refer back to where I come from. Yes. And the diary has been paid. And then, um, at the point of wedding, mm -hmm. refer to what you said again, and he or she realizes that I am not comfortable. Like, from where I come from, the moment that diary is paid, you're married. Because if you don't pay the diary and, you know, proceed to wedding, you know, from where I come from, they're going to look at it that, no, you're not married yet because those things have to be done. And even after doing those things, if you don't have money for, like, the ceremony bit of it, you could just, you know, sometimes you don't even really recognize it, like the ceremony bit of it, going for the white wedding. On a, so at that point where you now realize that, maybe you are the wedding point, you now realize that you're not, you don't want to continue with this marriage again. Can you break that relationship at that point, considering the fact that you have paid a diary? Listen to me. Mm. Everything is subject to the king of kings, and the kingdom is superior to worldly culture. You, those things we do is to satisfy all righteousness. We do it as honor. Are you hearing me? Mm. They are nothing. That is why Christians can never live and should never live together or engage in any a conjugal relationship until wedding. Because the wedding that recognizes, heaven recognizes, is the day you are joined together in holy wedlock. If we don't keep this standard, we cede authority to the uh, community and to their culture. We have dishonored the king of kings. So look at what happens. We recognize three levels of the, the marriage process. One is don't just pluck a sister and run off. You got to meet certain things in the community, do for them. That's one, including the traditional wedding, the dowry is one of it. The other one is the court, the, so that you know the legal system, you do what ought to do, give the 21 day notice and got to do it, and then the wedding. And so the modern way of aligning them is to put them all in one week, Wednesday, Friday, Saturday, or something like that, or two weekends, put them together. All this question of wedding, I don't dowry, after two months, three months, you've not done wedding, it's unnecessary putting pressure on both parties. It's better to align them. But the wedding is not in the reception. The official union conducted by a minister, qualified minister of the gospel, who on behalf of the Lord say, these two are now one. That is where the miracle takes place. The other one is part of the process. 
If up to that day, doubt came, confusion came, lack of peace came, lack of joy came, one is troubled, that as long as the church wedding has not taken place, no marriage has taken place. Anything can handle. The villagers know how to absorb it. Because you, you, they didn't lose as a man that lost. And so that's why two people are asked to truly prepare, ask the question, where is God in this? Is he the one leading us? So that when you do, we tell people, don't skip the process. If you don't skip the process, during the time of courtship, you can know whether this is of the Lord or not, and you can drop off. It is when people skip the process or allow themselves to be led by the nose to go and honor culture above the Lord, then they, whatever they find is them that cost it. Amen. Pastor, do you want to add something to it? Okay. All things are passed away and all things have become new. And where we usually have this problem is when we get born again and the community doesn't know us as being born again. Yes, yes. When we get born again and declare our faith openly, you know, walk in it vibrantly, evangelize everywhere, carry it. And when, when it comes to the time of marriage, I tell you, they all know who you are and where you are going. And how they say, Oh, that church, oh, that, oh, that sister mm. of this person, this daughter of this person, who oh, is that one that go to church? They say, Ah, this is church wedding, so they will know it. And again, we have the kingdom culture. What we do to our parents is just what the Bible says when Paul says, If you feel so up for your, you know, somebody who wants to go and do what you ought to do, amen. The bride prize, you have gone. You have given it to them. But for us in the New Testament, what is leading us is what our Bible says that is a righteous thing to go to the parents, to ask for the hand, what you ought to do, do it. And then take the lady. So is the taking the lady is the main wedding of the church. Now, we cannot because of, the Bible says, as many as are led by the spirit of Elohim, they are the sons. Somebody's eyes may be closed, but last minute, because of the love of Yeshua, he opened your eyes that, look, you are going into danger. Is it better to obey God? Or what people, or what say? people will say? Because that mistake, if you make it, you're stuck for life. So it's better you stand your grounds and obey the Lord rather than men. And it's not only in marriage that disobedience to men brings persecution. It does. Even when you start the church, it does. When you get born again, they persecute you. In the office, they do. Anywhere, because you don't do what they do. So it's not only in marriage that persecution should, uh, do come. So we expect it. But the most important thing around this is your salvation. Remember, what will it profit us to gain the world and lose our soul? It will not profit any, us anything to get into that marriage and end up in hell. So the most important thing is stand on your grounds. It's not really easy. The Lord has told you, and to obey him to the letter is the best to do than to get yourself into trouble. Mm -hmm. Even if it means not to return to that village, that's fine. After a while, they will come back. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. And so we want to round up today. Is it a help, Pastor Bo uh, Please ask. My question is, um, with the um, the one you discussed about the people who are wrongly married. Yes. That um, eventually, if they come to know the truth, you say the word says the truth will set you free. And, they, and once they are married, would they now, are they now classify as singles or, or when they divorce, are they now classify as singles? Because when they know the truth, they'll go to each other and maybe make a separation or a divorce to each other. And um, would they now be allowed to remarry? Okay, let's put it this way. If two people were in sin, I mean were sinners, and began to just, you know, just live together like that, they were, did not pass through any process, they did not work legally, and they've had it, they are now born again, they've had the truth that they are living in sin, okay?
Okay? Now, what does the law require people? It's called restitution. The one who is convinced will tell the other, listen, the Lord has opened my eye that we are living a life that is dangerous. If I die today, I miss it. Because of this, I'm not going to continue. And if the other person is also born again, it's easier. Two of them can agree that they will not continue in evil. They seek counsel and they can separate. It's not called divorce because they were not married in the first place. I hope you're, you can't divorce if you're not married. Amen? Now, when they separate, their past has been dealt with by the blood, and their decision they are making now in the light of truth has made them to be people who are single. But if the Lord wants them, if the Lord winks, decides to wink at that past, then they can regularize it. They can regularize it properly under guidance of a pastor. But supposing one wants to, the other one is persuaded for her soul's sake or his soul's sake, and if that person is a single, both of them are single because they never got into the holy estate of marriage. They began to sin, and sin maybe have produced some fruit and all that, and, but the truth has set them free. It's something we need personal if such people, they need a guidance. You see, there's certain counseling, don't just give it on, online like that. They need to see a minister who believes in holiness, who believes in the kingdom, who believes in truth, to guide them through the process. Amen? Is that okay? What I'm saying is that we can talk about it offline. I uh, said so we don't give a general answer that ends up confusing us. Pastor, do you want to add to it before we... and maybe they do their traditional wedding out of ignorance because they are not born again, okay? And then they just go and then have their children. And then the Bible says in the days of ignorance, okay? God winks at. But these two people genuinely, not for, they didn't come together for friendship. They didn't come together for, but genuinely, they did what they should do, maybe by court or by traditional wedding, before they got born again. Now they got born again and they say, alas, we didn't even go to the church for blessing, which means that all we've been doing, did you see? So that's why when Apostle says it's case by case, it's because the Lord knows the heart. He reads. He knows what the situation is. Such people can come and then have not wedding, but a marriage blessing. Because in the innocency of their heart, because they are not born again, they did what they should do. Maybe did civil and then did um, traditional, but then carried on. And then here they come to know the Lord, to know the word of the Lord. And here also is children. And they said, look, we are not living. It's different from living together. Okay, living together should separate because he's saying they too will tell you, and those who are genuine, they too also will tell you. The only thing is, people try to cover up and then they hide under the other one, but the Lord knows, amen. Amen. So, on Sunday, we'll continue the teaching, and next Thursday, I remember everyone here, Saturday, 24th, is the alumni reunion day, and the first mission conference uh, you know that we hosted right here in Elm Park we're going to be talking about uh, 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 the, uh, we're going to about kingdom we're also going to talk about what the Lord is doing in missions and so everyone who is part of school of ministry if you are in the UK come to Elm Park on Saturday 24th starts by 1 o'clock and on Sunday 25th we will have a great day, the anniversary, uh, and then we honor the two longest serving ministers, uh, Prophet Olama and Pastor Emilia on Sunday 25th, and by the grace of the Lord, they, those who did the master class in the UK, you'll be awarded your certificates for completion 
if you were not able to go to the USA, you know, on that weekend. And so, brothers and sisters, we will continue on Sunday, on Thursday, then after that, anniversary weekend, we continue the next Thursday and the next Sunday and see what the Lord has for us. Get this right. The greatest relationship you can ever have outside your relationship with the Father in the Lord Yeshua by Holy Spirit is relationship with a spouse. And if it is so, then in him should be the one that led you in and the one whose grace sustains you. Because marriage can make it easier for you to enter the kingdom and stay in the kingdom or it can be the greatest tool for your crashing out. Let's take it seriously. The Lord be with you. Let us pray.